It's me, Adrian Lee, the Wandering Art Historian. Thank you for coming back for yet another video in our epic web series, How to Read a Painting. What do we need to read a painting? We need the clues, right? And we've got those clues in uh, colors, symbols, and repeated stories. I'm so happy to introduce you to our next set of videos where we will be discussing symbols in art. How are we going to do that? Well, part one will be wheel, fish, and snake, three specific symbols. Then part two will be all about the apple in art. Then we'll cover the bull and ox, or bovine creatures in general. And then our last video will uh, discuss symbols hidden in plain sight. So let's get some things out of the way first, as in a good definition. What is a symbol? Something that stands for or suggests something else by reason of relationship, association, convention, or accidental resemblance, especially a visible sign of something invisible. For example, the lion is often a symbol of courage. That's the big part that plays a role in deciphering symbols in paintings, right? because we're trying to visibly depict something that is invisible, right? So let's warm up our art history muscles and start practicing a little bit with a discussion of the wheel. And I want you to think about the wheel because these aren't wildly obscure symbols or references. We actually still use a lot of these symbols in our everyday lives. The wheel is often a solar image uh, referencing cosmic momentum and ceaseless change. It's often associated with progress of humankind. And in the West, it's associated with fortune and fate, which makes sense because everyone knows America's game is wheel of fortune. You see what I did there? Um, in Buddhism, the wheel of law is a reference to the teachings of Buddha um, and often associated with the wheel of Dharma. The eight spokes of that wheel um, reference the eightfold path to enlightenment. Um, in India, the word samsara is Sanskrit for wandering or world and references the endless round of existence kind of like the cycle of um, death, rebirth, or a form of reincarnation, right? Um, that's great. Uh, and it definitely is, uh, has a similar connotation in the West. Um, but let's look at Christianity for a second and talk about some religious artwork. And you may remember this from a previous discussion on a painting we've seen in a previous um, video, we're going to use this particular painting, The Virgin and Child with Saints by Perugino from about 1496 to 1500 to discuss this. Um, what we see here is another um, sacred conversation. We've already talked about that where we see the Virgin Mary holding baby Jesus with saints and religious figures from throughout the ages, right? Um, also called maybe a mystic conversation. Um, we see the virgin and child in glory. Do you notice how they've got this really cool almond-shaped halo slash throne that they're sitting on, but they're above everyone else? Yeah, that means that they are in glory. And I want you to look at these four um, nice people that are hanging out with the Virgin Mary and baby Jesus. Let's take a closer look. We're gonna start with this gentleman right here on the far left, okay? Do you notice that he's kind of dressed in armor, almost as if he's going to war? He's got his helmet, he's got a bow. However, this gentleman has wings. So he's not a human, he is an angel. And if you guessed that that would be the Archangel Michael, you are correct. Um, he's often depicted wearing armor um, because he leads the armies of God in the book of Revelations. Let's skip over to this nice gentleman right here. Now here we have an older fella 
Um, but he's making this very interesting face. Do you notice? And he's making this face towards the Virgin Mary. And do we remember from a previous discussion about a male figure who was typically depicted younger, but still making this kind of <gasps> pondering, loving face towards the Virgin Mary? I know you know who I'm talking about because you're so good. Um, yes, this is John the Beloved, but he's older now, so he's now John the Evangelist. And he's probably on the Isle of Patmos writing the Book of Revelations right now. Um, to drive this point home, a symbol here in the corner, it's very hard to make out. It's actually an eagle, and that is one of his attributes or symbols. Now, we were talking about the wheel, right? Yeah. So here we have this nice lady, and she is a saint, and here is her attribute, the wheel. In a previous painting, we discussed that saints are often depicted with their symbol or attribute, and it's what martyred them or tortured them. And if you remember, that makes this Saint Catherine who was tortured on a wheel. Yikes, mm, not cool. Um, then we have this nice lady, right? Now, what the heck is she holding? I know you're asking me. She's got like forceps and little pincers here, little tweezers, and that just can't be good, right? Because if those were the things that were used to torture them, yeah, um, that would make this Saint Apollonia. The pincers and forceps were used to remove her teeth. Yikes. Okay, so um, in, Eastern thought the wheel, um, you know, a way of um, discussing religion and how to follow and observe your faith. And in the West, um, a torture device. Okay, let's go on to the fish. Oh, how do we use the term fish? Think about how you use it in your daily life. Um, the fish is often uh, associated with fertility, life and death. It can be associated with the idea of the mother goddess, the moon, the primeval waters from which all life comes forth. Um, in ast astrology, the symbol for Pisces is two fish. Um, what's very cool is that in Hinduism, Vishnu's first incarnation or avatar is Matsya, which in Sanskrit translates to fish. Believe it or not, that's who you see here. Right, and as Matsya, uh, Vishnu saves the world from a great flood, which is what you see depicted here. Interesting, interesting. Um, in Christianity, the fish has a lot of references, and since um, Christianity is the basis for a lot of religious art in Western art history, we should probably talk about that. Um, Christ calls Peter a fisher of men when he used to be a Fisher man, right? Um, the fish is a symbol of the early Christians because of this called the ichthys. So in the early Christian church, when they were being persecuted by the Romans and they had to hide out in the catacombs, um, they had to communicate with each other through symbols. And that is how this fish symbol came to be. What they did is they took the phrase, Jesus Christ, God, Son, Savior, and took the first letter of each of those words in Greek, which incidentally spells ichthys, which is the Greek word for fish. That's pretty cool how that worked out. Um, that's known as um, an acrostic. Incidentally, there is yet another big fishy story from the Bible, but in the Old Testament. And that, as you see depicted on the far right, is the story of Jonah and the whale, right? Um, Jonah was supposed to go um, prophesy to a town, but he didn't want to do it. And he got kicked off his boat and thought he was dead, but he, is, he had actually been swallowed by a whale. And he was in that whale's belly for three days and three nights. Um, but his story is very interesting because God gave him a second chance, right? That's the whole point of the story. He repented and then he went to the town and prophesied like he was supposed to do in the first place. However, in art, uh, we find that a number of artists take the stories from the Old Testament and use them as pre-configurations 
of Jesus Christ. Basically saying there is a parallel and a connection. And in this case, the story of Jonah, the parallel would be that he was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, and Christ um, was in his tomb for three days and three nights and then rose again. So it's kind of a, a parallel, like a foreshadowing, if you will, okay? Then we've got this guy, the snake. Um, a lot of people are kind of scared of snakes. I don't mind snakes. They do startle me, but I like them. Uh, the snake is often a symbol of the primeval life force. And because the snake lives underground, it is often associated with the underworld. However, snakes also shed their skin so they can be associated with the idea of renewal or regeneration. Um, let's take a, a couple of looks here. Um, there is typically a general link between snakes and the idea of wisdom and prophecy. Um, in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, we have the rod of Asclepius, which you see right here. It's a rod with a snake or a serpent coiled around it. What's interesting is that was associated with medicine and healing in ancient times. And it actually is still to this day because it's part of the symbol called the Star of Life which represents emergency medical services. So the next time you see an ambulance, look for this and know that it originated with those ancient Greeks. That's pretty cool. Um, in some agricultural societies, the snake represents the fertility of the soil and that's super important because the snake slithers through the crops and does what? It eats the rodents that would essentially destroy someone's crops, right? Um, let's check out this image. What the heck is going on here, right? In Hinduism, Vishnu rests upon a giant cobra with multiple heads. That's what you see going on here. It's not a flying carpet, that's a giant snake that he's resting on, okay? And this snake is referred to as Shesha, a primal being of, cre of creation, and is often referred to as the endless Shesha or the first Shesha. Um, they're floating in the ocean of the changing world, and it, sh the name Shesha actually comes from the Sanskrit word for remainder, which implies that when all else ceases to exist, it is Shesha who will remain. Um, this is Lakshmi, uh, Vishnu's wife, massaging his feet. That's a story for another day, yeah. Um, in India and throughout Asia, specifically in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism, um, Naga, N-A-G-A, is a deity in the form of a king cobra. That's what you see here on the right. Um, and that particular image is from Thailand. What's cool is that they are viewed as guardians, typically benevolent to humans. Um, they live underground in like their own kingdom. And they're often thought of as guardians of treasure. And that's very interesting to me because I feel like that sounds familiar, right? Especially to us in the West. If you study English literature and even more specifically anything by Tolkien, you note that there is a big giant reptile that lives underground in a mountain and guards treasure. That's right, Smaug, right? Um, here we have um, the Egyptian pharaoh headdress. And in that respect, um, a, a hooded cobra that looks like it's about to strike um, is often seen on those headdresses because they are associated with a, pr a protective quality and they are associated with the pharaoh's royal power, right? That's pretty awesome. Um, however, let's take a quick jaunt back to the West and back to Christianity for a second, because there's a pretty important snake that we see in religious artwork, isn't there? Yeah. So here is this epic, amazing painting. And if you're like, wow, this is intense, you're right, it is. I included this particular painting not just to talk about the role of the snake. Um, however, I wanted to tell you this also really amazing fact that it's a rare example of two amazing artists working together collaboratively. 
This is from the golden age of Dutch Baroque painting, which if you've ever taken my classes or attended any other lecture of mine, you know that I love. Believe it or not, Jan Bruegel the Elder did all of the flora and fauna you see here, and Peter Paul Rubens was in charge of depicting the figures. How awesome is that? This painting dates from around 1617, and you may have guessed our topic of this painting if you said, well, that's probably Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, you are right. What they're depicting here is the Garden of Eden with the fall of man. Okay, what does that mean exactly? Well, first of all, you see all of these amazing creatures living together in perfect harmony, except for one. And that's this guy up here, right? Here's the serpent or snake. And what does he represent? Well, that's Satan, right? And supposedly the story goes, God put Adam and Eve in this utopia and said, there's only one thing you can't do. And that one thing you can't do is eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what's the one thing they want to do? Oh, human nature. Gets you every time, doesn't it? So who tempts them to eat this fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Satan, disguised as a snake. And that's what you see going on right here, OK? Quick side note. Um, do you notice Eve here depicted with those long, flowing, golden locks? Yeah. Remember our discussion on the color yellow? Mm-hmm. Also, before we move on, look at this gorgeous tree. Um, do you notice what fruit they are eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Could that be an apple from an apple tree? Yeah, totally is. I can't wait to talk to you about apples in art. Oh, man. So here we have our snake. Let's see another image. Now, you can always tell a Michelangelo fresco or painting because our figures always look so jacked, right? And then the genitalia is just kind of stuck on after. But here we have a scene from Michelangelo's frescoes on the uh, Sistine Chapel ceiling, depicting different scenes from the Bible. And of course, you've probably guessed that, again, we've got another fall of man situation going on over here. And over there, we have the expulsion from paradise. And um, it's not going well, is it? We've got this angel here thrusting a knife into Adam's head. So not going very well, basically. Now we have two scenes from the story, but what's dividing the scene is what's very interesting because the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is what divides the two scenes, right? But it's not just the tree, is it? What is coiled around this tree? The serpent, Satan, who tempts Adam and Eve, right? However, look closely. It starts as a snake and its top half is what? Yes, a human woman. Great, awesome. Um, yes, throughout art history, we see that the serpent, AKA Satan, who tempts Adam and Eve and causes um, well, first original sin, disobedience and expulsion from uh, utopia um, is merged with a human female. Awesome. Let's look at this painting. Um, if you're like, oh my goodness, Adrian, what the heck is going on here? That looks like something by Hieronymus Bosch. You're absolutely right. It's totally by Hieronymus Bosch. I'm not even gonna zoom in on that far right panel because that far right panel depicts hell and damnation. And if you know Bosch, you know that he can be a little graphic with uh, what happens in hell, right? Okay, what are we seeing here? Well, first we're seeing a triptych. We've seen diptychs, but now we've, we're seeing a triptych. One, two, three, triptych. Um, and this is an altarpiece depicting a story called the Haywain. And it's more this idea that if you let your life just get consumed with chasing after material wealth and the things of this world instead of 
focusing on your faith and chasing the good things, uh, the heavenly things, the more spiritual things, then basically your life is like riding a, a reckless hay wain or hay cart, trundling through life, and where does Bosch say that you're heading? Hell and damnation, yes, exactly. So another example of the Dutch saying, this is what not to do, right? Teaching us by the negative example. And boy, life sure is chaos when you're riding a hay wain, isn't it? I think it's so interesting to see the couple on top here, or actually it's uh, three or four people, and these poor angels are praying on their behalf. And I love how um, Bosch has depicted Jesus looking down because he's like, what are you guys doing? I love it. That's my favorite part. Um, so not only do we have wheels, but let's focus on our serpent because he pops up over here. Or should I say she pops up over here yeah, here in the details of the far left panel, we see the creation of Adam and Eve, but also original sin and their expulsion. And look at this, we've got another serpent that's also part human female. And do you notice how eerily similar she looks to Eve? Okay, that's kind of not cool, Bosch. Kind of not cool. Let's look at this. Ah, what is this abomination? What, what the heck is going on here? Yeah, this is a piece um, by Hugo van der Goes, um, and it is part of a diptych, so we're back to two again, um, depicting the fall of man, but here, it's not just a serpent, is it? It's not just a snake. This is some Komodo dragon salamander hybrid that can stand on its own back feet and reach up. Oh, look at that. Head of a female woman, human person. Yikes, darn it, again. So here we have Adam and Eve. Um, I want you to look closely at this painting though, because um, Adam is, you know, covering himself. Eve is not bothering to cover herself. Do you notice what we have here? We have these very cool blue irises. So um, the iris is another flower of the Virgin Mary, and here it's blue. And remember our talk about blue. First of all, it's very rare in nature, so these flowers would be very rare in nature, but also it's associated with what? The divine and the sacred, and typically reserved for who? The Virgin Mary, right? The iris actually translates to sword lily and is often used to allude to the sorrow of the Virgin Mary during the Passion of the Christ, basically when he is crucified and dies and is buried, okay? Um, interesting because if this is a diptych, what does its companion panel look like? It looks like this, and there's some very interesting things going on in this panel, right? And when you put them together, I hope that you're seeing our amazing composition here. Good job, Hugo van der Goes. Um, do you notice the way in which Eve is making this very dramatic angle with her arm being reached up into that tree, right? And do you see the parallel in its partner painting? It's the Virgin Mary who is also making that diagonal line, right? It's a very cool and subtle implication, maybe not so subtle, that there's some connection between the Virgin Mary and Eve. And what I think Hugo van der Goes is trying to say is that the Virgin Mary being pure and innocent and obedient to God's decision right, to be the mother of Jesus, counteracts what Eve did with her disobedience. And that would make sense because here we have Christ who looks very similar to Adam over there, doesn't he? Notice um, his face 
in the face of Adam and how Adam is covering himself and the only covering over Jesus is this very small loincloth. An interesting parallel because Christ is often depicted in religious paintings as the second Adam or the new Adam. Basically, he was sent to fix everything that Adam and Eve messed up with their disobedience, right? Interesting. Before we leave this particular painting, I wanna point out, this is probably Joseph of Arimathea um, because he's typically depicted um, with the garments or the wrappings that would go around Jesus before he was put in the tomb. And remember, Joseph of Arimathea uh, donated an unused tomb. Um, this older gentleman here would probably be Nicodemus, a follower of Christ. This makes uh, uh, the Virgin Mary, as we said, notice completely in blue with a bit of white, still emphasizing her innocence and purity. Notice we've got this gentleman assisting the Virgin Mary, young, youthful, looking at her very lovingly. That's right, John the Beloved, completely in red, right? Who is this nice lady at the feet of Christ praying and weeping? That will be Mary Magdalene, and we'll talk about her in an upcoming video. So as you can see, symbols really go a long way in art, don't they? I'm so glad that you took the time to watch yet another video with me. If, if you can, if you have the ability to donate a dollar or two to my virtual tip jar, Boy, that would mean so much to me. If not, maybe just like the videos, comment, share them with people who might be interested in learning more about art, um, or subscribe to my channel. Thank you so, so much for everything you've done to subscribe and share and tune in to every video. I'm so grateful. Thank you. I will see you next time. Bye.